Excellent. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone who's come along to the OLS 6 webinar. This will be recorded um, and also uploaded to YouTube afterwards for people who couldn't attend on the day. Um, so today I'm going to just be talking a little bit about uh, what open life science is, what we do, um, and about the next cohort of open science training. Uh, so um, I start out always with a few quick reminders. Uh, some of these, if you've been attending virtual meetings during the pandemic, will be reasonably familiar by now, but it doesn't hurt to go over them anyway. Uh, so please keep your microphone muted. Uh, you're very welcome to talk or to ask questions. Uh, just unmute when you do so. Uh, just make sure that um, that way we don't get any background noises um, or any of those cute neighbors chickens coming through. Um, so we also have a code of conduct. There is more to it. You can see it on line 40 right now on our Etherpad notes. Um, and the, the essence of it is that we, we ask people to treat each other with the respect that you would like to receive and generally be nice to one another. Um, like I said, there's a lot more to it than that. It's not only two lines. Um, so we do encourage you to take a, a few minutes just to read that. Um, but the other part of this is if at any point you experience or witness any behavior that you believe isn't in line with the code of conduct, uh, you can report that either to team at openlifesci.org, which reaches the four um, organizers of Open Life Science, or alternatively, if, for example, if it's about one of us, then you can reach out to any of the other organizers individually. Um, so it's Berenice, Yo, Malvika, or Emmy at openlifesci.org. Um, and if you're looking at the um, notes at the moment, the, those email addresses are all on line 42, so you don't have to guess how to spell our names. Um, those are the main things. Uh, this, this will be, when we upload it to YouTube, we'll also make sure that we correct the captions. Um, but on the top left of the screen, you should be able to see um, that it's saying it's scre screaming. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's streaming, uh, live streaming to otter.ai. Um, so that's just automatically captioning it. Um, sometimes it's a little bit incorrect, but mostly it's reasonable, just uh, so that you can see what I'm saying when we're talking. Um, I think those are all the starting up bits. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about what open life science is by bringing up a nice little presentation. So share screen. Uh, let's click on that and then. This is me pressing wrong buttons on my side where you can't even see it. Let's try this again. And there we go. Okie dokie. Uh, can someone confirm that you can see a screen that says bonjour and hola and all those lovely things? Yes. I've got thumbs up. Thank you, folks. There was one time when I was terribly embarrassing. I didn't realize I was presenting the, the wrong screen the whole way through. And because in Zoom, you don't see the chat when you're presenting, I had no idea because they only messaged me on chat. Um, so I'm extra careful about checking it these days. Anyway, hello. Um, many, many languages here. I basically only speak English and Hebrew, which is a little green shalom that most people can't read there as well. But maybe this has your language as well. Uh, so first of all, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Yo, the one there in blue, third along. Uh, the four people you see here are the Open Life Science organizers. Uh, so there is Bernice Patu, uh, Malvika Sharan, um, myself and Emmy Tsang. And we're the four people who um, co-founded and do most of the organization. We are hopefully expanding the team a little bit at the moment. Uh, so we have Paz, who is working with us right now for a month, as she mentioned. And we're hoping that'll be longer as well. But really, that's only a few of us. And actually, we are a huge community. Um, by the way, I know at least a couple of you all have actually seen some of these. And I do apologize if you're watching stuff you've seen before. Um, but it's important that we make sure that everyone has the, the basics here as well. Um, so we have around 400 members right now um, of Open Life Science. And these are people who have um, been people who've given the training, who've offered their expertise, who have mentored, and people who have participated in the training that we run. And so you may say, oh, well, what is this training about? You probably have an idea if you're here today. Um, but essentially, we're working off the premise that science really only advances when we work together. Um, because it's very easy to compete in research, like in many places. Um, but we're trying to actually to focus on people sharing and collaborating and building on each other's shoulders. 
Um, and to give you some context around this, so this is a text specific study that we're talking about here, but it, what we find is that when people share things and when they work openly, that strategic intent around that open work tends to be much more effective than merely opening it saying, we, if you build it, they will come. Uh, so this is intentionally designing the pathways and the methods of participation and different roles and different expectations that you may see when you're sharing the things and when you're building a community. Um, I'm saying I'm um, far too much. I really apologize. <laughs> so we're looking to actually culturally change towards making research more collaborative and more open. So that's the open air link right at the bottom here in a kind of hard to see green on that gray background. It talks about the four things that you need to change culture towards openness. It's leadership, vision and strategy. We need to agree and we need people to actually say what it is that we need to do. We need to take targeted measures to, measures to get there. We need to be as transparent and accountable about that as we can and then work together to build that shared vision. And so part of the goal that we have in open life science is that actually we can try and agree on that vision and refine it because I don't think it's ever going to be static and we always do the best we can and then we learn better and we do better after that. So it's something that need, we need communities around. Um, and it's important to know open life science isn't the only place that does open science. There are many, many open, open science and open research communities out there, uh, but we're quite proud of the one that we're building. <laughs> Wait, no, I've just pressed the wrong button. Let's go forwards instead. So our goal is to help researchers and stakeholders who um, work in research to become open science ambassadors or open research ambassadors even. So whilst the program, we call it open life science, and I, we definitely, we started with the phrase open science, I much prefer the term open research because there's a lot more in research that doesn't count as a science field. Uh, for example, humanities very often aren't included there, but they are just as equally relevant. Um, and when we founded Open Life Science, we actually started all four of us from life science backgrounds, and we thought we'll start with a domain we know. Um, but practically speaking, within RLS, when you saw that page, it's like, ah, it's 400 little dots of different people. Uh, we've had linguists there, we've had anthro anthropologists, we've had archaeologists, mm -hmm. um, we've had independent researchers, we've had undergraduates, we've had so many people from so many different walks of life in so many countries. Um, and so the, the, the phrase open life science is actually almost like old when we open is still correct. The life science, maybe not quite as much um, So we want to be more inclusive than that, ideally. Um, and what we do is we try to explore the open concepts around open science and open research and apply them to our work one step at a time. Um, and so that's why our program, we run it actually over 16 weeks. I think the next slide. Hmm. No, yeah, okay. I thought there was a slide coming up and there wasn't, so I will, I will not worry about that. Uh, some, of the, some of the topics that we cover over these 16 weeks, we talk about open data, storing uh, your data in ways that you can share it if it's appropriate to share. We also talk about when it's appropriate not to share because part of open research is being responsible about when things are open and respecting others when it comes to things like privacy. Uh, or things like indigenous data rights, you know, probably many, many other examples around this as well. We talk about um, sharing source code. So not all research does require source code, but quite often people will wrangle uh, their, their data in some way before it goes to publication if they're a researcher and understanding how to share that is very important. If you have um, hardware that's involved in your research, then it's good. Um, if it's something that you've designed or that you've made, then you can share those designs and then others can benefit from it as well. Uh, you may have methods or protocols, especially if you're in, you're in a lab, but I'm sure in many other settings that you may wish to share. Um, we've got an open access beside the methods and protocols. Huh, that's not quite right. Um, that should be open protocols and then open access should be its own line where we talk about sharing your traditional publications. We'll have to fix that slide. Uh, we talk about sharing your research, tongue tied, sharing results early in the form of preprint, which also allows more people to comment and collaborate in, in other ways. Um, we talk about sharing your reviews. So if you are reviewing someone else's paper, sometimes you can review, review openly depending on the uh, journal's permissions. You can transfer your skills through training and uh, open education. You can collaborate with other people. Sometimes it's called citizen science, other times it's called participatory science. And I think I like the second word a little bit better. 
because uh, citizen science sometimes has um, overtones of the scientists telling others what to do and not necessarily listening. Um, whereas participatory science sounds much more like people are actually involved in working together. Um, we talk about networking. A huge part of what we do in OLS is actually networking. So people are expected throughout the cohort to invite experts uh, to, to talk about the projects that they may be working on. Um, and the idea is that that's all, as well as giving the expertise also helps build the network around you. Um, and last, but very definitely not least, we talk a lot about community building and it's specifically about inclusive community building um, because you can put your work online and uh, like I said, it's, it's very rarely build it and they will come. Maybe if you've got something very exciting or if someone just happens to boost what you're doing. But most often you have to consciously design if you want other people to be involved and to contribute uh, to what you're doing. So talking about the different ways that you can build community is an important part of what we do. Um, and to sum up, one of the most important things that we try to, to constantly reinforce and reiterate uh, openness shouldn't be a thoughtless default. So you should plan what you're doing and you should think carefully about how to involve people and how to make things open in appropriate and meaningful ways. Um, so you will, if you participate in OLS, you get to lead your project openly, share your work effectively and try and bring culture change in your community. Um, and I think the culture change also is a very important thing that we want to underscore because um, sometimes people may not get as far as they want in the projects that they're working on when they're participating in the OLS cohorts, but if they still bring the working methods and the behaviors around sharing things into future collaborations, then the individual project itself is perhaps less important so long as it's the culture change that you're learning and that you're spreading to others. There we go. I think I was looking for this slide earlier. So we, we train over 16 weeks. Um, and the idea behind 16 weeks, you might think, wow, that's a long time. It's not a terribly huge commitment, though, um, because it tends to be a couple of hours a week. It's not like it's 16 weeks full time. Um, and so we have two things that we do. Uh, we have what we call cohort based training. And this is tends to be an online call. We flick between a couple of different slots in the day so that people from all around the world can attend at least half um, because we tend to have people we've had people from six different continents i think i say this every webinar i'm still looking for a researcher in antarctica if you know one please tell them to sign up and then we can get that seventh continent um, but my point being, yeah, so we have these um, usually an hour and a half long cohort calls. We get experts to speak on some of the topics that I was talking about earlier. Um, and we have interactive breakout rooms where people discuss the implications of these topics um, for their project, or maybe they clarify things they didn't understand, or maybe things they don't agree with. Um, because like I said earlier, things are fluid. You know, we, we do the best we can, but sometimes not everything is correct, or maybe there are nuances we weren't aware of. Um, and in addition to this, you have a mentor. So you can apply on your own or as part of a group. And a mentor is assigned to each project, whether that's an individual or whether that's a group. And then you, um, you can use, you have one call with your mentor and then the next week tends to be a cohort call. Um, and th this means that um, because you apply, when you apply, you have a project idea that you're working on, you learn some of the open concepts, and then the next week you can actually reflect on them, try and apply them. And if you're stuck or if you have ideas or if you want to bounce it off someone, you can speak with your mentor about how that applies to your specific project, or in some cases, maybe it doesn't apply to your project. So that gives you hands on practice um, and it helps it sink in a bit better because it's over a long period of time rather than like um, an example I use is that I have in the past been a qualified first aider. I think my training is now expired. But if I do a if I do a two day or a three day course and then no one starts to get injured for months, then I don't remember how to apply it by the time anyone finally is injured. So having something that's spread out over a longer time that you actually apply helps it sink in a bit better and makes it a bit more useful. Um, so today, this is our pre-application webinar. Uh, we have another webinar, um, or it's just an application clinic. So we don't do the presentation. It's basically just Q&A, because uh, quite often people will have thought about a project they want to apply with, or maybe they can't find a project and they want to discuss ideas, or maybe you're not sure about something. So we have uh, some uh, another clinic in a few days just to allow people to ask any questions that they might have about their applications. And then on the 7th, the applications close. Um, so I will note that one very important thing, the platform that we use, OpenReview, it takes a couple of days sometimes to get your account approved. 
So after this call, if you don't have an open review account, go and make one um, because we don't want people to not be able to apply because their account wasn't approved until after the deadline. Um, then August 1st, we'll announce when we have successful applicants. And then finally, it actually starts on September 19th for 16 weeks. Um, so we have a break at the end of the year. So a lot of people tend to go away um, towards the end of December. So we make sure that we're not actually asking people to turn up from sitting under a Christmas tree or whatever it may be. Um, we have a short break and then there's a final graduation presentations at the end. Um, so if you're curious what the graduations are about, we have uh, several YouTube, uh, what's the word, playlists where you can see graduations from our previous cohorts. But essentially people present for about five minutes about what they've learned and applied over the 16 week program and uh, where they think they may be going in the future. And these tend to be really great. Um, <laughs> I think we, we've had three for RLS five last week, and then there's two more that we're going to do because um, we just have to have a lot of slots because we have a lot of participants. So there's two more graduations coming up towards the end of July. Unfortunately, after applications close, I would say go and watch those. Um, and this year we are also experimenting for the first time, the final graduation slot that we have towards the um, end of July, or maybe it's the middle of July, um, is bilingual. So we had a lot of Spanish speaking participants and we've arranged to get a translator. So if anyone presents in English, it will be trans translated into Espanol. Um, and then people can also choose to present in Spanish and then that will be translated into English live. Um, so that's an experiment. We're going to see how that goes. Uh, I'm quite excited. Um, let me see, do I have any more slides? Right. Ah, yes, this is a good one. Right. Micro grants. So we want to make it as easy for people to participate as possible. I see those claps. Thank you. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to participate. Um, and so we offer small, small seed grants. And there's two, two kinds of these seed grants that we offer. One is uh, if you want to participate and you don't have a webcam or it's hard to afford the data to connect to the calls or um, like in some cases people don't have reliable electricity, then we can help out with things like, um, you know, a, a mobile phone charger battery or a mouse or a, a microphone or a headset, things like that. Um, and these are things that can, people can apply for just as part of their, their registration once they're accepted into the program. Um, and we arrange either to ship them directly to the person or we can um, yeah, and purchase them on their behalf or they can purchase it and then reclaim. Or in, in some scenarios, we can also offer the cash up front if that's easiest because it depends on the resources available in the country that you are. Um, but there's also another kind of micro grant, um, which is that if you've been participating in the program, I think we've said for at least eight or 12 weeks, then sometimes you have a project that you, you might wanna launch a bit more. So let's say you, you decided you want to have a Zoom account for your calls, or maybe you would like to um, register your, your project as an organization in the country that you're based at. Um, so those kind of things tend to take money, but when your project is really small, that's really hard to get. So I know like the first few projects I launched, I just paid for stickers out of my own pocket and silently resented it, but still thought it was worth it. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we can help with as well. One, once you've been participating for a few weeks, those uh, project costs are available as well. Oh, I should add childcare. It's not on this list, but if there's anything we can do to help around that, to help you participate, then we can, we can offer those for micro grants as well. Um, and there's a dedicated budget for this. So it's, it's, um, there, there's always some, some money available. Uh, let me see. Right. Yeah. Final slide almost. No, still not final slide. I've got some more slides. Stop listening to me when I say final slide. <laughs> these are acknowledgements. Um, so we are a funded project these days. Uh, we weren't always. This started as a fully volunteer project and we've been very, very lucky to move on to a little bit of funding and then move on to the point where I'm actually paid to do this job. Um, and historically, we've been supported by the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, TU Delft has offered um, staff time as a Galaxy Freiburg. We've been supported by EOSC Life, the, the project, but the two biggest grants that we have come from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and from the Wellcome Trust. So we're a not-for-profit organization, uh, but we are always looking for other ways that we can fund things like the micro grants and paying mentors and paying expert speakers and so on, as well as doing other community projects. Uh, so the last cohort, uh, we named 
hope. So every cohort that we have, uh, people, people after a couple of weeks are asked to propose names for their cohort. So OLS1 was Open Seeds. OLS2, for I think probably obvious reasons, was the Masked Cohort. Um, OLS3 was Perseverance, because uh, it was not long after the Mars rover landing. Um, OLS4 was Kinaz, which uh, was, is a rune for um, openness. The most recent one, um, I, I love all the names, but I really love that, that, that the group chose to name our cohort Hope. Uh, it just it just it immediately gives you a little bit of hope and we had an amazing 71 project leads participating in the cohort um, and networking and working together um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what OLS 6 will name itself. Uh, so this is a bit of an overview about what we cover in many of the different program uh, many of the different weeks, so we also have some optional things um, on some weeks as well, uh, this might be hard to see. So I'm just going to give a really quick, we have a welcome call for the cohort calls. Um, we're not actually mentioning the, the mentoring calls in here. We talk about project road mapping, things like um, planning what you're doing. Uh, we use GitHub for our training. So we suggest you have files around an open license, that you create contributor guidelines, and you add a code of conduct. We do project management, open hardware and software and data. We talk about uh, designing for inclusivity, including bias, as well as uh, creating pathways for community interaction. Uh, we have a careers call. I really always love the careers call. We get people from various walks of life. Um, so we always have at least one academic PI involved, but then we also have people who are from other areas as well. I'm just gonna pause and take a drink because my throat is very dry. Whew, that's a relief, okay. Um, we also talk about knowledge dissemination, so things like sharing data that you may have, code, preprints, etc. I've been through some of this list earlier. Um, we talk about ally skills, so many of the people who participate are privileged in some way, and we learn how to use that privilege to step up and help other people who may not um, benefit from the same privilege. Um, and then we talk about things like managing your data as a researcher and engaging the public. And like I mentioned earlier, we also talk about uh, talk about we have graduations, which are some of the most exciting parts for sure. <laughs> um, so we had um, in the first, first five cohorts, we had around about 250 people who were trained and mentored. Many people return later as mentors and experts and also call facilitators. So they do things like help um, correct and verify the transcripts that we have because the automatic transcripts are never correct. They upload the calls to YouTube um, and the mentoring, the experts and the call facilitators are all paid roles with honoraria um, because we believe that um, we believe that it's um, what whilst uh, volunteering is nice, it doesn't put bread on the table and not everyone equally has time available. Uh, so I see a question here that you have about 30 projects and 70 project leads. Um, that is a great question. Um, so there's a lot of people who have group projects. Um, so either is fine, you can apply on your own or you can apply in a group. We find that people who have a group tend to find things slightly easier in terms of progress um, because we have assignments on many of the weeks. Um, and if you can actually know that, you know, you can do the assignment one week and your colleague can do it the next week, it tends to be slightly less exhausting. Um, but many people have done this individually and worked well. Uh, do some participants want to lead a project but have not yet formally defined it? Uh, no, so the um, people do have to have a project uh, because otherwise it's very hard to, just, uh, to apply the concepts effectively. Uh, you know, if we say go and have go, go and add a code of conduct or add a readme, um, that's very hard if you don't know what the readme is about. Uh, so we do require some sort of project. Um, if people are interested in applying but don't have a project to work on, then um, A, we can discuss this in the Q&A later, um, but we do have some suggestion ideas of possible options that people can work on uh, for potential projects that, um, that can help our less out as well as giving people project ideas. Uh, does that answer it, Nick Nikki? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Cool, cool. Uh, so some fre frequently asked questions. Um, what counts as life science and can my project apply? your project can apply. <laughs> Basically, so long as you are interested in openly disseminated research, we don't mind what domain you're from. Um, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, open life science, the life science is very much uh, 
an artifact that's no longer particularly correct. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a mentor or an expert, we usually recommend that you participate in a cohort first. Um, on rare occasions, we invite um, mentors in without having gone through the cohorts, uh, but it does mean that you are more familiar with the project as a whole and all of the, the um, things that go on if you've been, uh, if you've participated at least once and it makes it easier to mentor. Um, and some acknowledgements. So we've got the beautiful faces of all the amazing people that have um, been part of our cohort a huge number of organizations we've been involved with. Um, so this program was actually launched out of a previous Mozilla program um, and we wouldn't be here without Mozilla today. I am still studying with the University of Manchester and need to submit my thesis by the end of the year. <laughs> um, Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya, group that we love to pieces. They were an OLS one, but they are big strong allies and we love them. Denby has been one of our um, funders and collaborators for a long time. Um, and I think that really is the last slide this time. Okay, I've been talking for a hundred million years. Thank you so much, everyone who's been patiently listening. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point in time? If you prefer to type them, you can type them in the Etherpad on line 67. I'll just pop that into the chat one more time. Um, or you can unmute or you can ask them in the chat. All is good. Susanna. Hi, I'll put my camera on now. No one's walking around behind me this time. Um, so I guess it's more of a question of actually setting up a project and in regards to my experience. So I've been accepted to be an enrichment student at the Alan Turing Institute. Yay. Um, and the title of the the project that I had in mind was quite vague in I mean in the sense that I do have some objectives but I'm still not clear exactly how it's going to all develop um, and the title is ethical standards and reproducibility of computer models in neurobiology so it's like with a focus on ethics and how we think about that kind of stuff in neuroinformatics and I, I saw this opportunity and I've spoken with Malvika before um, and I think it would be great to have OLS, to work with OLS as I'm doing that, but I wonder, I, I feel a little bit lost on whether I'm going to be overwhelmed by, because I'm already doing my PhD, uh, which is on making computer models of neuroscience. And then on top of that, I'm thinking about ethics. And on top of that, I now have another mentor to, so it's just like, I guess it's more of a question of what do you think <laughs> about my current status? Should I apply to this? And yeah, how, how do you think it will go? That's a really good question. Um, what I could suggest, I we have had a Turing enrichment student participate uh, in a previous cohort, so maybe we could link you up to her and ask how she felt uh, with everything that was going on. Um, that's Laura Carter. Um, but I will write this down because otherwise I will forget. I'm pretty sure I've spoken with her as well, actually, because uh, I've been sending emails to everyone. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, so she, she, I mean, if you haven't chatted to her about this, I would absolutely recommend just asking her experience. Um, the other thing that I can offer is that um, if you're not really sure, but this does relate to the work that you're already doing, we do talk a lot about project management um, and milestones early on. So it might be that it can help you um, sort of sort out your, your thinking and plan the vision that you'd like to see over the next few months anyway. Um, people do find in the first few weeks that there, 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 there does seem to be a lot. So I know some people sort of, I, I get the impression they feel like we just open a hose and spray it at them for the first few weeks until they get used to it. 
Um, so actually one thing that we are asking um, Paz to do, I'm not, not trying to put too much weight because I know it's only your second day, <laughs> but we're asking her to look at the assignments and spread them out a little bit so that they're not so full on early on. Um, but I would say that the assignments do tend to help you think through what you're doing. So it's not like it's just work, but it's also work that helps you contemplate. Um, so if it's something that relates to what you're doing, that's probably gonna be helpful. If it's something extra, then it's probably gonna be more strenuous, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's very intertwined, so I don't, I am a little afraid that it might be a bit extra, but I don't think it might be. <laughs> yeah, mentors help provide a certain level of accountability as well. So they're, they're not your boss, but you know, you're meeting someone every other week. You're like, yeah, I better get something done. Um, mm. So I think some people sometimes apply specifically because they like having the idea of that extra accountability as well. Uh, so um, for example, Malvika was participating in the OLS 6, and she's one of our founders. <laughs> and um, I didn't say earlier, hey, Chefs, yeah, it's lovely to see you here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Chefs is one of our cohort members in OLS 5. So folks, um, does I any... was just kidding. Oh, sorry. I just joined because um, I wanted to 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 have more ideas and we're we're always happy how... to have you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What did you want to hear? Sorry, I didn't so, mean to talk over you. No, I'm just participating. I'm just participating and listening to newcomers to the OLS families. Yep, fair enough. <laughs> okay, um, I see we have a couple more questions in the chat, so I'm going to answer those. Uh, so one from Nikki, how do group applications work? I have a project that's in the early stages involving a few colleagues, but which should expand over the summer. So I'm not sure we would be able to find names by the early July deadline. Can group applications add members after the deadline? Yes, that is absolutely fine. Um, so add, add anyone's name that you know you're adding um, early on, but if people add, you know, if after you get the acceptances or even partway through, um, the only thing we need to do is make sure that they're on the right mailing lists. Um, and if, it, if it's too far through, then they'd probably find it a little bit hard to catch up, but it still should be okay. And all of the calls are on YouTube anyway. So um, people can catch up using YouTube, although we do prefer people to attend uh, the calls if it's at a reasonable time in their time zone. We never ask someone to come at 3 a.m., for example. Um, but yeah, I think groups are often fluid. So people, groups will grow and, and shrink depending on who's available at a given time. Um, and Julia says, could you please give an example of what an assignment looks like? Yes, I will try to share my screen and see if I can pull one up. Um, You're, you're muted. How long have I been muted? <laughs> not, not long at all, like since you just opened that. Okay, I'm not sure how that might happen even then. How curious, okay. Um, I found the schedule now anyway. So uh, first week we have Welcome to Open Life Science. Um, always, the, so the website always has a schedule and it's the best place to refer to like your single source of truth. Um, but we have a presentation where we ask people to look at what we call the open canvas um, and road mapping. So these are things that are actually presented during the call. Um, and then we ask people to complete this assignment here. Uh, so these are examples that show you what 
um, how to fill it out, but the idea is that this would be completely blank um, and that you'd fill out all of these boxes. So it's probably something that you could sit down um, in half an hour and have a think about. And then you'll be like, I don't know how to fill out maybe that box or that box. And then that's something you might want to talk with your mentor the next week. Um, another example could be, I'll go back, uh, roadmap. Yeah, um, so this is a guide that will talk you through write, writing a roadmap for your project. So this might be just saying, you know, in six months time, I want to do X. Um, and in three months time, I want to do Y. And then maybe breaking it down to smaller chunks. And this here suggests that it's about a 45 minute exercise. Um, so I would say that the open canvas or defining a mission statement, um, which you will say, go away and try and come back with, you know, um, a two or three sentence paragraph or just a couple of sentences about what you're going to be doing is the sort of thing that uh, is an assignment. Does that help? Uh, also, I note that we've had someone else join. Uh, I'm going to take a stab at saying your name. Feel free to laugh at me if it's really bad, but hey, Mikolaj. Hello, hello. Hello. How, how bad was it? No, it was good. It's Mikolai. Mikolai? Okay. So just the J was wrong. I was, I was debating, was it uh, like a, a Y or an H or a... <laughs> okay, thank you. It's lovely to see you here. I'm afraid you missed the um, earlier presentation. Oh, it's fine. I, I found you just by accident right now and it was so surprising. Oh, I was, was browsing for the web page and I have seen that the seminar is right now. So. Well, um, it'll, the, the bits that you've missed will be uploading to, to YouTube in the next few days um, so that you yeah. can catch up. Uh, so, Susanna, the schedule that I've linked in the chat, um, that will, uh, yeah, you, you can scroll up and down to see all of the links, but that, that will be your god if you, <laughs> once you participate, it always has everything you should need in it, um, pretty much, um, like links to the notes and so on. Cool. Does anyone have any more uh, questions? Maybe you've been thinking of a project idea and you're not sure, or maybe you're not sure if, you're, if, if your project is necessarily suitable, or maybe there's something else that you are wondering about. Go for it, Susanna. So do you have any tips for making a good application. I have the OLS application guide open in front of me, but I guess if you have anything else to say about that, that would be super nice. Yeah, that's another really good question. Uh, so my, my strongest recommendation here would be um, to make sure that you show why you care about working openly. Uh, so sometimes we'll have people who looks like maybe they're trying to develop a project, which is fine, um, but they haven't talked about the openness, about you know why, why they're particularly interested in doing something. And it, it looks like equally they could be launching it for, for a market or something, you know, for industry. Um, but specifically the openness that's most important. And it's okay if people don't know a lot or say, I haven't yet and I want to learn, that's fine. The main thing is that we need to see that intent that you want to work and collaborate openly and inclusively. Super. Uh, so I'm just going to check the etherpad notes. I don't know, um, Mikolai, I'm not sure if you had the chance to see the notes as well. So I'm just posting them in the chat again. Thank you, everyone who's seen those notes posted about 75 times in the chat. I appreciate your patience. Um, I do wish Zoom would show old notes, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, if anyone still has any other questions, you can feel free to add them in the etherpad line 67 is the perfect place for this. Um, and I'm actually gonna stop recording now just in case there's anyone who wanted to ask questions but who would prefer not to be on the recording. So I'm just gonna um, press stop now. And thank you everyone who may be watching on YouTube. <laughs>